on. All right, well, sorry guys, I thought I had a train conductor's uniform. Could have sworn I had one of those over the years of crewing all those wigs and hats. Thought I had a train conductor uniform, but I don't. So we're just gonna have to make do with what we do have on standby. Um, I have a top hat, okay, yes, and uh, a fake mustache. Yeah, that'll work, that'll work. Train conductors look like this. This is the old-fashioned train conductors, yes. Um, attention everybody, the train is in the station! Whoop, whoop! Okay, I want you to board the closest destination. We're gonna be going to Queentown. Queentown, followed by Rabbitropolis. Yeah, everyone's a big fan of Rabbitropolis. Hashtag not a furry. You do not have to be a furry to go to Rabbitropolis. That is a misconception. Then after that, we're gonna be stopping in Chicago. Everyone, the 1.45 p.m. to Chicago, and then after that, Abnormal Tagsburg. That's right, uh, don't need to go into more detail than that, Abnormal Tagsburg. Right, okay, everyone board the train, come on, whoop, whoop! Go, go to the titles. By the way, trains are geography now, because geography is- You know, I also wish I had, like, a model train set. I was never a model train kind of kid. I was more of a Power Ranger Megazord kind of kid growing up. But, um, I don't have a model train set here. But what I do have is the Cyanide and Happiness board game Trial by Trolley. And I got the derailed edition. I was a Kickstarter backer. So I got the little model trolley there. And Trolley Tom! Everybody loves Trolley Tom! Track reacts with Trolley Tom. Okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about the sea train. It's a train on the sea! What the hell are you doing, Oda? Listen, listen, buddy, buddy. Kid that can turn into rubber. Fine. Zoro swinging a sword, slicing a mountain in half with a sword in his mouth. I'm like, all right, the jaw strength on that man. Sanji literally just spinning around a bunch and lighting his leg on fire. Nami's boobs! I believed a lot of ridiculous stuff in this story, Yoda, but a train that runs on the water? Good lord, man! What are you smoking? Okay, alright, so actually, I looked this up because I was curious. Um, apparently we can't... Um, make trains that run on the water. We can make trains that have, like, run on the water, like, on bridges, and there's trains that can go under the water, like, through tunnels, but, um, I don't think we've really developed a sea train in our world yet, so Tom must have known something that, uh, he wasn't explaining to other people. Um, the way that Tom explained it, we didn't go into great detail on all of the logistics of the sea train, but essentially what Tom's plan was, he's like, alright, here's the deal. I'm gonna make a locomotive steam engine. That's the easy part. The hard part is how do you get it to run on the ocean? And he's like, well, we're gonna lay down some tracks in the ocean that are like, you know, a a couple of feet just below the surface of the water so that way uh, we're not gonna like tie them down so like ocean currents and big waves even like aqua laguna this giant tidal wave that hits every year even in that situation the um you know the the, the track will just kind of sway with the ocean currents it won't just be locked in place and be destroyed uh, what about all the giant sea monsters Tom what about these giant leviathans that come out of nowhere and eat ships whole what about those it's like oh well we can install a very special, like, whistle, like a sound-emitting device on the sea train that, uh, you know, just shoots a bunch of, like, sonar into the water. And then, you know, uh, Sea Kings will avoid that because it's really annoying. You know, the question is, honestly, why didn't they just do that to every single ship? You know, Tom's like, well, I can make a device that deters Sea Kings, but, uh, can't- uh, That's patent. That's mine. I can't give that to anybody else. Because, um, yeah, eventually Vegapunk installs the Sea Prism Stone, like, uh, coating, uh, like the layers for the battleships, so the Sea Kings don't really notice the ships, but you think the sound displacement thing, maybe it, uh, maybe it also annoys other, like, uh, marine life as well, not just Sea Kings, right? So it might make fishing difficult if, like, every single ship was outputting that, like, sonar. Um, but that was the basic plan of the sea train, which, you know, in terms of manga anime logic, it, it, it works, sure. I would still think that there would be a number of things that could cause the track to be destroyed. Um, in One Piece, it's like, oh, no, no, the track will be fine. It'll be okay. You're worrying too much. It's a damn train on the ocean. Come on, that's pretty cool. And, of course, I'll do it with a dawn. I'm Tom, damn it. It's like, okay, he is Tom. Tom. He's teaching Frankie about what he can do, and Frankie was a member of the Straw Hats. Tom knows his shit, guys! Alright, so, uh, all aboard! Whoop, whoop! Alright, so, interesting thing, this mustache keeps falling off. Hey, Barry, do you want a mustache? Here you go. Um, <laughs> you're the new train conductor, Barry. Okay, here, here you go, Barry. Here you go, buddy. Okay. So, um, 
The C train was first shown when the Straw Hats were getting uh, kind of near Water 7, and they just kind of stopped at, uh, you know, in the middle of the ocean, and then boom, a train just kind of passed, a as it happens. I mean, they've seen weirder stuff than this. They've already been to the sky and everything. I mean, like, just traveling on the ocean, and then boom, a, you know, a locomotive just, all right, hold up, you know, locomotive crossing in the middle of the ocean, it's the Grand Line, what are you going to do? They eventually make their way to the shift station, where they meet Kokoro and Chimney and Gombe, and uh, Kokoro being the main conductor of the C train, and then she kind of fills them in on what it is. I'm like, yeah, the C train is this, you know, this new piece of innovation out of Water 7. It was invented by a guy named Tom. Uh, if you're headed to Water 7, you'll learn more about it as you go, and then there's all a bunch of shipwrights there, the galley law, so if you need repairs to your ship, you know, Water 7 is the way to go. And so, uh, it was actually a really cool thing that Tom did, because as we learn about the history of Water 7, we find out that it was, it was a rather poverty-stricken island, because it didn't really export anything. The entire island, it was rather beautiful to look at, but it was, like, sinking in incrementally every year and they didn't really make a lot of stuff so you know trade and stuff were kind of avoided nobody really went to water seven and it was just kind of a place that was like a hotbed for gangs and things and you know pirates would hang out there so people just kind of avoided water seven but then tom had an idea he's like i know how i could solve this innovation and so he makes the sea train it's like okay now we can easily connect our island water seven with neighboring islands Okay, so we don't have to worry about the weather climates of the Grand Line anymore. We don't have to worry about getting on a ship and Sea Kings attacking us. Or, you know, the weather or the ocean, you know, the, the crazy weather patterns of the Grand Line destroying our ships or whatever, because it's really dangerous to go from one island to another in the Grand Line. But with the Sea Train and the magical tracks that do not bend, um, or they do sway, but they don't break, um, you know, you can go from one island to another reliably, you know, in a safe manner. Um, I guess pirates would still be a concern, but but this sea train is going really fast and it's made of metal and stuff so even if like a pirate ship like stops in the center of the track and just be like we're gonna do a train robbery man boom the train just plows right through it you know because it's pretty strong uh frankie tried to stop it and um well, that's the whole reason why Frankie's a cyborg now, isn't it, right? Frankie tried to stop the train, and he got flung away and landed on Scrap Island and just took a bunch of scrap metal and just shoved it into his body, and that fixed him. I can buy that, but I cannot buy a train on the sea. There's just, there's limits, Oda. There's limits. Frankie just trying to stop a train, and the first, the fact that he survived at all to begin with, you know, he just gets flung, lands on Scrap Island, he's like, need to rebuild myself. Oh, rusty nails, hammer, ah, 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 what's this, a refrigerator door, whatever, ah, gotta install soda, <laughs> you know, I could buy that, but okay. But anyway, this project was pretty massive, and it took about 10 years to complete, but Tom finally succeeded, damn it, and he managed to connect Water 7 to a bunch of other islands around uh, the immediate area. Keep in mind that whenever you arrive in the Grand Line at Reverse Mountain, you got like seven different routes that you can take. The route that the Straw Hats decided to take, just, you know, Whiskey Peak, Little Garden, Drum Island, that's just one of seven. And then we find out when we get to Sabaody, where all these paths converge, you know, all the other supernovas, like Hawkins, Beji, Kid, Drake, they all traveled like different routes than the Straw Hats did to get where they were at Sabaody to all meet together, right? So you can imagine these other islands that Water 7 connects to, it's kind of breaking the original magnetic chain of the Grand Line where now you can travel to these islands without the need for a log pose or an internal pose, okay? You just get on the train and then you travel. And the way that it's been working at Water 7, it's just a normal thing there. You know, people don't even worry about it anymore. It's just like, oh, are you going to take the, um, the 245 to Pucci? I'm like, oh yes, indeed. I should be back by uh, nightfall. I'll get the six o'clock return. You know, like that's just how it goes. Now there is, when the Straw Hats arrive pre-time skip at Water 7, there's only one C train. And that is of course the Puffing Tom, named after Tom. Ever since after the time skip, the Galila company has actually constructed a secondary sea train called the Puffing Ice, named after Iceberg, who's the mayor of Water 7. So now there are, in fact, two sea trains, but you can imagine only having one sea train, you know, and you got a lot of different cars for it and everything, but, um, you know, that would make travel a little bit more, like, not as easy as it is in our world, because you have multiple trains in our world, and train travel is kind of on the down low right now, but, well, at least in the United States. I mean, I guess not a lot of people take the train anymore. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, you 
you have to kind of wait for the train to go to like Poochie and then you can't take it again until it returns. So there's probably like certain days where they only go to certain islands and stuff. But at any rate, the four main islands that the uh, Puffing Tom connects, I guess five main islands because you include Water 7 in there too, the City of Water. That's also where the Blue Station is. The Blue Station is the main uh, train station terminal on Water 7 and all the other islands I would assume also have like a differently named uh, train station. The only other one we know of is the Day Station on Any's Lobby. So Any's Lobby, the government island, that was one of the big criteria for actually making the uh, the C train to begin with because how this whole thing started a little bit of backstory is that uh, Tom was the one that built the Oro Jackson for the pirate king Goldie Roger well after Roger was you know he's the king of the pirates he was executed and everything they started going around the world and basically punishing everybody that even had anything to do with Roger and in connection with him and Tom was on that list you know a judiciary ship arrived from any's lobby and they're like Tom you're the one that built the damn ship for the king of the pirates this man that launched us in the great pirate era all these pirates out there in the world doing stuff. Do you know how many times I just said pirate in this last sentence? That's all on you, Tom! And Tom, uh, he comes up with this idea of like, hey, well, what if I can create a steam-powered locomotive that can run on the water? Will that be okay? I want to save my island. Now, the judge in that particular instance was a relatively kind and actually fair and just judge. Not something that you could just uh, take for granted in the One Piece world. Um, but he actually thought about it and he's like, man, okay, could that train also connect uh, Water 7 and the other islands to any lobby the judiciary island and he's like yes it could connect them anywhere in theory you know if you have enough time and you know pip spit and you know sweat and uh, moxie and dawnness then yeah you could basically connect it anywhere you know i'm sure if tom if tom never died and when I say Tom died, we never actually saw him die. He was just taken away by the sea train. We assume he's dead. We didn't see him in Impel Down. He was probably executed. So if Tom was never executed, though, my point is he might have been expanding that track even more so to the point where he might have uh, linked up all of Paradise. Or hell, going even one step beyond that, if that sonar device that he attached to the, you know, the engine actually did deter Sea Kings as, as well as it could, um, maybe you crank it up a little bit more for the com belt, but that's my point. He could have maybe made a line that stretched over the com belt to connect the Grand Line to the East and the South Blue. Now, the, the world government might have had a problem with that to begin with, because that's maybe, like, making it too easy to travel places. Like, making, like, a little bit of a, like, a few, like, an island-connected network, that's okay, but, like, connecting the entire world, that might have been a problem. Don't know exactly how you would go over the red line also, so that might have been a new engineering feat. But, hey, it was Tom. He might have been able to do it. In fact, Frankie might have been able to do it, too. After the series is all over and done with, and the Straw Hats make it to Laugh Tale and everything, and they go their separate ways, if that ever happens, I I could see Frankie going back to Water 7 and like continuing on with the sea train project and expanding the lines to connect the entire world. Especially if that theory happens where the red line is like partially destroyed by the end of the story, like Reverse Mountain is destroyed or whatever, or the area above Marijua is destroyed and the entire world is opened up. I could see Frankie taking advantage of that. Like, all right, well, the world is now open up to ships, but now let's open it up to the sea train. Let's continue to expand because the world government or the Tenrubito aren't around to like, you know, put the damper on us anymore, right? Um, but that's just conjecture for right now because Tom is kind of dead. But yeah, Eni's Lobby was one of the first islands that was connected to. But then the other islands, we had uh, Pucci, which is the gourmet town. Then we have San Faldo, which is the carnival city. And then we have uh, St. Poplar, which is um, the, 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 the city of the Spring Queen, I think it was called. Okay, so we got those three islands. Now, we don't really get to see all of them in grand scope. I think the most of the one we do get to see is St. Poplar because that's the island that takes place during the uh, CP9's independent report. After uh, CP9 is devastated by, you know, the Ennies Lobby Buster call and Luffy, and, you know, punches out Luchi and everybody and he's in a coma, um, Blue and O uses his door door powers to save all the members of CP9 and then they emerge in this destroyed island, Ennies Lobby, and they literally just walk the tracks. They just walk the sea train tracks in the ocean trying to get somewhere and they eventually arrive at uh, St. Poplar, which I'm assuming St. Poplar is the closest island from Ennies Lobby. So they get there and then they help out the townspeople and everything. It's raining when they arrive arrive, but it's also, it also has a climate, it's not always raining there. Um, it has a bowling alley, you know, because the CP9, they go bowling. Read the CP9 inde independent report again, because it's really interesting. It really just shows how they work as a, uh, like, they're more of a team. It's not like, you know, oh, we work together just because we have to work together. We don't really care about each other. No, reading that independent report, you really do get the feel that, hey, they were trained together since they were kids. They were all orphans, basically. Um, they have different viewpoints on things and stuff, and Lucci is maybe a little bit more direct and stuff with the, the cruel, you know, absolute justice sort of angle. Um, but, um... 
they they're their friends they're kind of colleagues even after work you know because they help out luchi they get him fixed up and then they all go out bowling together can you imagine walking into a bowling alley and seeing the cypher pole just hanging out like blue nose like oh califa got a strike okay you know that's that's pretty cool right all right so they're hanging out in saint poplar um you know and there's a bunch of different areas there like shops and boutiques you see califa and kumadori going shopping so whatever um eventually pirates the candy pirates attack saint poplar and luchi just you know leaves the smackdown on them but he you know once again he's luchi he's a little bit you know bloodthirsty so he really maims the the candy pirates um they're they're probably not going to be pirates anymore they're probably dead yeah luchi probably just cold-bloodedly murders them in the middle of the roads of saint poplar so the people of the town are like uh so they have to leave and so they leave saint poplar there's a little girl that kind of gives them a flower like thank you for saving our town thank you for leaving the bloody corpse of our enemies in the middle of main street <laughs> have this flower and so they take it and then they leave you see this scene here yeah the cp9 they're all afraid of that little girl because that little girl was like <laughs> here you go and so they leave and um that's the most we get to see of saint poplar i don't think we get to see any of san faldo san faldo was mentioned to be the carnival city you know how when the straw hats arrived at uh, water seven there were those people wearing those masks everywhere that's where you know you get to see um you know bluno wearing the carnival mask and all the members of cypher pole had those carnival masks just at the ready when they attacked Iceberg's mansion and the mask, of course, that Saga King picks up to become the mighty Sniper King. Uh, we still don't know the identity of Sniper King, but we do know that his mask originated from Water 7. The plot thickens, guys. The plot thickens. One day, one day we'll find out who you are, you son of a biscuit. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's the Carnival City. So since there's a carnival like Mardi Gras going on at San Faldo, and it's connected with the sea train, sort of like all the other islands are sort of also in festival mode because it's so easy to travel between these islands now that their cultures kind of merge in a sense. So that's pretty cool there. That's the reason why we see all the festival masks. And then finally we have Poochie, the gourmet town. Uh, this was mentioned quite a bit. We actually do get to see the mayor of Poochie as well as his daughter and their fateful butler. Also this guy guy Hapa. Hapa is a cool guy. Yamao Hapa. All right, so this dude, I love this guy because he is an example of just a random no name. Well, I guess he has a name. It's it's Yamao Hapa, but He's just an example of a character that Oda gives, like, detail to. Like, he's a background character, but Oda actually gives him a little bit of a cool scene, okay? So this dude right here is originally from uh, Poochie, and he was a bandit. He was a bandit, uh, bandit. He was a bandit that eventually became a carpenter, uh, I guess after the sea train, you know, was built, and after he's like, I don't have to be abandoned anymore, I can actually have, like, an actual business now. So he started to be a carpenter, and uh, he was married once, and he was divorced. You see, all this detail, I'm not making this up. This was literally stuff that Oda already explained, right? So, um, when Usopp uh, had his fight with Luffy, and, you know, Luffy, you know, smacks him down with Bullet, and he's like, you know what, you can have the Mary, and then, you know, that had that moment there where Usopp was no longer part of the crew very briefly, uh, Usopp wanted to still care for the Mary and repair it as best as he could, so he went to Yamal Hapa's shop in order to get some wood and some tools and, you know, uh, metal plates and stuff to try to fix up the Mary as best as he could. Well, it was about ready for Aqua Laguna, so this guy was just like, I can't go, what are you talking about, kid? There's a giant tidal wave about to hit tonight, I'm evacuating! I'm going to the shelter. I'm closing up shop for the day. And Usopp was like, please, please. Just, he's taking his money out of it, all the money he has, like only a handful of berries and just giving it to him. He's like, please, man, just give me whatever this will buy me. I'm just asking you just to stay open for just an extra five minutes. I know, please just give me something. I don't care. And he looks at it and he's like, well, I mean, ugh, you only got like a few thousand berries here. This isn't going to buy you a lot. And he's like, okay, well, what if I trade with my tools? And he's like, hey, kid, we don't do like because Usopp was just so kind of in that moment just he felt so bad for him you know it's just like he's all beaten up from his uh the, the fight with the the Frankie family he's covered in bandages plus his fight with Luffy and he's like this is all I have left in the world can you just give me some nails and some wood please man I'll trade you everything I have I have some cow traps in here what will you take for these rotted eggs and this is like a video game where you go to a shop and you take all the junk that you acquired throughout your adventure and like here you go here's just like a bunch of twigs and you know broken metal pieces i found in the woods here you go all right well, well these are right here millions of dollars um so the dude feels so sorry for usopp he gives him a little bit more than his money is worth he gives him some extra wood and some extra supplies and you know stuff to fix up a ship and he even provides him with um you know it, it even is even added to because usopp's like walking away with these giant like pieces of lumber 
and he's all injured, and he probably weighs like a couple hundred pounds, and he keeps falling over himself, and he's like, uh, kid, do you need some help with that? And he's like, no, I got it, it's fine, it's okay, I, oh shit, it's okay, I got it, it's alright, fine, and then Yamal's just like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, here's some rice balls, kid. Rice balls filled with Mizu Mizu meat, the specialty of Water 7. And so Usopp's like, thank you so much. And, and Oda even went into further detail, like he made those rice balls himself because he's, you know, he's once divorced, so he cooks all his meal. He's a good cook. And so, you know, like so much detail and background information given to just some random Water 7 civilian. But he was such a nice dude. He gave off the impression of like, kid, get out of it. Like, have you ever worked in retail and someone comes in? He's like, are you open? We closed five minutes ago. Yeah, but, yeah, but are you open? You know, in that situation, he's like, get out of here, kid. We got to get going. It's evacuation time. But he just, he looks so damn depressing. He's just, all right, kid, here, take some wood and some extra supplies and some nails and a hammer and uh, you look hungry here, have some freaking rice balls. I'm not a damn devil. Okay, all right, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. I can help you carry the wood. All right, all right, just be careful. Make sure to get somewhere high ground tonight before the tidal wave hits. Closes up shop. <sighs> Poor kid. Oh, well, did all I could for him, you know, and then he goes to the shelter, and that's it, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, go for Happa, Happa, man, he knows where it's at, Happa for Straw Hat, but on top of them, yeah, we also get to see the, uh, the, actually, like, the ruling family of Poochie, and I actually wrote all their names down because most of their names are puns, we have, um, Bimin, who is the mayor of Poochie, just short, frumpy-looking fellow with an awesome mustache, I must say, and then we have his daughter, Marumieta, which is just Japanese for I see all, or it's all exposed to me. Um, she is a princess-looking character, although I guess she's not really a princess, she's just the daughter of the mayor. Because these islands are more of like a, an elected democracy, rather than like the monarchies that we see on like Alabasta with kings and queens. Like, like um, Iceberg is essentially the ruler, the king of Water 7, but he's not a king, he's a mayor, he's elected. Poochie's kind of the same way. So certain islands can have their different, like, you know, types of government. It's just as long as they pay tribute to the world government, they can have whatever government they want. So Maru Mieta, though, she dresses like a princess, but she's not really a princess, and she's always carrying around uh, binoculars, looking at everything very curiously. She was also present at Water 7 after the events of Loch Aqua Laguna. She arrived to kind of bring relief from Pucci to help out the people of Water 7 to rebuild, and that was also the exact moment when Frankie was about ready to join the Straw Hats, and they, um, ripped off his Speedos, and he was running through town naked, and you get to see her and her butler, like, she's intensely staring at Frankie's magnificent uh, package there. And then you have her butler, her butler is also a pun, Yame Nahare, which just means, now stop that, young man, young lady, now stop that, Yame Nahare, stop that! You know, so the butler's like, oh, please, man, please, don't look at that man's chug, oh... You know, um, so how they are rather splendid, I must say. So that's the interesting characters from Poochie, but that's all we really get from them other than being a gourmet town, so I'm sure some lovely food was there. And, uh, yeah, after that, San Faldo, but we don't get anything from San Faldo. And then Eni's Lobby, which I'm sure you're well acquainted with Eni's Lobby. I did a Geography is all, everything about that already, but, um, yeah, you go check that out there. But Eni's Lobby, weird, uh, weird island in and of itself. I'm still a little curious about the giant hole in the ocean and what's up with that. Oda, please explain that by the end of the story. Like, even if it's just off the cuff, even if it's just like, oh yes, uh, the previous user of the Gravity Gravity Fruit, he also apparently created Eni's Lobby. That's why there's a giant hole in the ocean. I'm like, okay, fine, fine, whatever. Even if it's mentioned offhandedly, I don't care. Just explain the giant hole that exists in the middle of the ocean and why it's daytime all the time. Is it an awakened user of the, uh, the Pika Pika no me? Like, what is up? I just want to know before this story is over, okay? Well, anyway, yeah, the, um, the sea train was also very prevalent during the Water 7 arc itself, and it even had its own little mini arc, remember? Kind of like a transitionary arc in between um, Water 7 and Eni's Lobby. You had Robin being taken away on the sea train, and so Usopp, Sanji, and Frankie, they, you know, went on the sea train going from car to car, beating the crap, all the other members of the CPs. You know, Sanji beats up Jerry from Cypher Pool 6, I believe, and then there was Wanze, the chef from CP7, and then CP9 was there. Nero, the newest member of CP9, Frankie beat the crap out of him on the roof of the sea train. So even like that, I like that little mini arc that Oda did 
where we even got to see the inside of the train and how it was laid out and everything like that. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Oda's also done, like, like Monsters was kind of set in, like, an Old West kind of town, and you think of the steam locomotive, you think of kind of, like, an Old West kind of visage. So I kind of like that Oda included that the way he did in the story. Water 7 is still one of my favorite arcs in One Piece for that reason. The sea train and that whole, like, design of it and that kind of, like, sort of an anachronistic, sort of, because we're supposed to take place in, like, the 1500s in the Age of Pirates, but we also have, like, steam technology and then laser technology, so there's a lot of anachronistic things in One Piece World that Oda just kind of throws together, but, but it works, you know, somehow he makes it, he's like, you don't, when you arrive at Water 7 and there's like, there's a train on the ocean, I mean, I was freaking out by that, but you don't actually freak out by that, really. You're, you're just like, oh yeah, this is One Piece. That makes perfect sense. And the way that Oda fits it into somebody's like backstory, like Frankie and Iceberg and Tom and Kokoro were all connected to the sea train. And uh, Yokozuna, also the giant frog that always sumo wrestles with it. You know, it, you, you start to develop a bond for the train, much like Trolley Tom has a bond for his happy little trolley before it kills everybody on the tracks. So, yes. Uh, if by the way, if you've never played this, I would look at... I don't know if you can still... Because I got it off Kickstarter. I was the backer. But I, I don't know. I mean, just go look it up if you can buy this. It's actually a pretty damn fun game. I've played with some friends before. Before all of the... Uh things happened with, uh, that. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, that's the C-Train. Uh, also, huge, huge opportunity for me. I know I've already done a Geography is Everything on Water 7, but... I did not get a chance to put Kokoro in a thumbnail. I think this is the first time she's ever been in one, guys. <laughs> Woo, Kokoro thumbnail! Sexiest damn thumbnail I've ever had in my days. I don't know if this video's this thumbnail might not even be able to stay up. It's gonna go the way of the Perona video, guys. So you better you better take advantage of it while you can, right? Okay. Also, just letting you know uh, in case. Okay, fine. I'll I'll show you a picture of sexy Kokoro. Yes, there is sexy Kokoro. Oda drew her in her younger years. Yep, same person. God bless you, Oda. All right, well, uh, train's pulled out of the station, everybody. Whoop, whoop. All right, uh, Conductor Barry, uh, take it away. Okay, yeah, all aboard. Watch for the closing doors. All right, moving out. If I was a conductor for a train, that is totally what I would do. I would just be the conductor and be like, everybody on board now. That's not the train, that's just me. Okay, bye everybody, Techie signing out.